Yes, ma'am. It's visible. It's visible. Yeah. Good evening, all. This program, I'm happy to be part of this program, Pearls for Primary Care Pediatricians. I thank the president of IAP TNSC, Dr. Ismail, the secretary, Dr. Rajendran, the treasurer, Dr. Gopal Subramaniam, for giving me this uh, very nice opportunity to uh, talk about this topic. And I also uh, like to thank uh, for the inputs, the following doctors, Dr. Ashwath, Dr. Ramakrishnan, Dr. Anthony Terence, and Dr. Shanti Sangharidi. So this topic, I'm going to talk in three parts. One is going to be the introduction. Second is how we prepare an outpatient clinic for receiving the emergency cases. And third will be certain case scenarios. So what is this introduction? We all know that just like a family doctor, there is also a family pediatrician. So parents, they come to the family pediatrician because they know the person very well. They trust the pediatrician for potentially life-threatening illness and injury. So the practitioner has to be prepared to provide the initial and optimal care. And a practitioner, according to the scope of practice, he may be seeing a sick child every day or one sick child every week or one sick child every month. So what about the preparation? So we'll imagine a outpatient clinic in a village or a suburban area. I'm talking the minimal infrastructure. So they may be having a two rooms, one waiting room, one doctor's room, and they may be having the basically maybe two staffs alone. One will be a receptionist and the other person will be a nursing assistant or a medical assistant. So with this scenario, with this outpatient clinic infrastructure and staff, what preparation uh, that, uh, that practitioner has to do? So we'll see it now. So preparing the clinic staff. And second is about the minimal emergency equipments and minimal emergency drugs. So what a peripheral practitioner has to keep in his clinic. So as I have told you, the minimal staff a receptionist, a medical assistant, or a nursing assistant, even with these people, they, they have to be trained to triage the children. We, we, can, we have seen doctors having 100 pay children in the uh, waiting room, 100 children waiting to see the doctor. So the receptionist or the medical assistant has to be trained to triage these children to identify the children who are sick among that crowd. Now, what are the... Uh, possible emergency equipments the doctor should have. It is preferable to have a portable oxygen cylinder with flow meter, pro uh, preferable to have a portable suction, face mask, nasal cannula for oxygen delivery, a nebulizer, ambo bag with a different size mask, a finger pulse oximeter, a BP apparatus with child and adult cuffs, glucometer with strips. And if you, uh, sometimes you may have to start an IV so that time you should have an arm board, tape and sterile dressings. And to keep all these things, we need a recitation cupboard, preferably with labels. All the equipments, you preferably label them and keep it. And according to the scope of practice, you can have a non-rebreathing mask, endotracheal tubes and laryngoscope. Next, this COVID times, we are all very familiar with the PPE kit, that is a personal protective equipment. So we can have a hand sanitizer, gloves, of surgical mask and gowns. Now, what are the emergency drugs the practitioner should have in his clinic? First is oxygen. So oxygen is, of course, a drug. Then we can have nebulizing, the respiratory drugs, the nebulizing solutions, the salbutamol, ipratropium solutions, corticosteroids, injection dexamethasone, injection navel also has to be there. Then we should have an injection epinephrine, one in 1,000 solution, which is, has to be loaded and kept in the uh, emergency cupboard parastomol rectal suppositories, the anticonvulsants like injection medazolam, injection lorazepam, 
Then for IV access, you need a Venflon, IV set, IV fluids like normal saline and disposable syringe. And according to the scope of practice, you can have tablet prezosin and anti snake venom also. And all these drugs, emergency drugs, always uh, periodically check the expiry date of these medications. And it's preferable to put all these medications in different colored boxes and label them. It is easy in an emergency to take it out. So with this uh, introduction and preparation, now we'll go to the case scenarios. Case scenarios, I'm going to talk uh, 10 case scenarios in a short way. The first three are new, related to neurological, the next three are respiratory, and the last four are related to cardiovascular. And what is the scenario format I'm going to talk with you? It is four points. First was uh, I'm going to give a short history. Second is the short clinical findings. Third is diagnosis and fourth is management. So all the case scenarios will be told in this following format. So first case, a one-year-old child is brought to the OPD with the complaints of fever uh, three hours duration, convulsions for the past five minutes. And there is a past history of febrile seizures and the child is not on anticonvulsants. So this short history, fever and convulsions. Convulsions, uh, fever is only for three hours and convulsions are there for the past five minutes. Now the child is in your clinic in front of the doctor. So when the doctor observes the child is having active convulsions, which is generalized tonic clonic, the frothing is there, the child is febrile, the doctor checks the perfusion, perfusion is normal. So what is the diagnosis here? It's a one-year-old child with febrile convulsions. The more appropriate term will be febrile status. So any convulsion lasting more than five minutes, you call it as status epilepticus. So this child has a febrile status. So how, are we, how is this doctor going to manage this febrile status? Take care of the airway and breathing, turn head to one side, suction of the secretions in the nose and mouth, start oxygen six liters per minute through face mask. Then you can give IM intramuscular midazolam 0.2 milligram per kg. Then uh, keep the parastomal rectal suppository 15 to 20 milligram per kg. And with the glucometer, try to check the blood glucose. And if you're able to obtain the IV access, try to give injection lorazepam 0.1 milligram per kg over one minute. But whenever you give an IV anticonvulsant, always try have an ambu bag and mask nearby and look, watch out for the respiratory depression. Okay, then when to refer? Now this child has got a febrile status. Uh, the doctor in the outpatient clinic can do all the above measures giving oxygen, giving iamidazolam, parastomal rectal suppository. So give all these measures and then you can refer to the tertiary care because any child with febrile status, sepsis and meningitis has to be ruled out. But suppose the, the febrile seizure is not a status. Suppose a child has got a convulsion only for one, it's a known case of febrile seizures, has convulsions only for one or two minutes at home. And when the child is coming to the clinic, the child is alert, looking everywhere. This child you need not refer. So if it is not a status epilepticus, you can manage in your outpatient. Just you have to evaluate the cause of fever. But if it is a febrile status, it needs further management. A word about midazolam nasal spray. It is available in the strength of 500 microgram per nasal spray. The dose is 0.2 milligram per kg per dose. The one-year-old child, 10 kg weight, we have to we can give two sprays in each nostril. And about parastomal rectal suppository, the strengths available are 80 milligram, 170 milligram, 250 milligram. The dose is 15 to 20 milligram per kg body weighted. In one day, you can give four doses if necessary, and it has to be six hours apart. Next, uh, we'll come to the second case. A two-year-old girl child is brought to the OPD at 10 o'clock in the morning by the mother. The complaints will be fever three days. The child is not playing actively for the past two days. Child developed convulsions on this particular day at 9.30 a.m. So the problems are three days fever, decreased activity two days and convulsions. And the mother says the convulsions, uh, further probing the history, the convulsions by GTCS, it was uh, uh, lasting for three minutes at home. It subsided by itself, but the child is appearing to be, appears to be sleeping. 
so the child is brought in the sleeping state and furthermore history there is no previous history of febrile seizures no vomiting no respiratory gi or urinary symptoms so what is the history we have now the fever three days decreased activity two days convulsions in the morning and uh, convulsion subsided but the child is continues to be sleeping according to the mother and when we examine consciousness the child is unresponsive when you open the eyes and see there is nystagmus this for this we give the term non-convulsive status epilepticus about this i'll be telling in the next slide the breathing is normal spo2 is normal circulation is normal but the child is febrile the temperature is 102 degree fahrenheit when you examine the cns there is neck stiffness so what is the diagnosis can it be a simple febrile seizure or a febrile status no because the same parameter child had lethargy prior to the onset of seizure and when you examine the child has neck stiffness so clinically when you're able when it is difficult to differentiate between a febrile status and acute bacterial meningitis lumbar puncture should be considered so this child has a bacterial meningitis because the, clinically the child has a fever altered sensorium convulsions and signs of meningeal irritation So what is non-convulsive status epilepticus? This is an ongoing seizure activity without motor compo component. And how to identify this non-convulsive status? There will be an impact, the child will have an impaired consciousness and there will be eye changes in the form of nystagmoid eye movements and also twitching of certain muscle groups. There may be eyelid twitching or twitching of the fingers. So why I gave this case scenario is to highlight the importance of examining the eyes for non-convulsive status epilepticus in a febrile unresponsive child with history of convulsions. And any child, any unresponsive child, we have to roll out hypoxemia, check SpO2 uh, with the finger pulse oximeter to roll out hypoxemia. So this particular child whom you're suspecting a bacterial meningitis, in your clinic, you can uh, just uh, give oxygen, suction of this, uh, suction not necessary. You can give oxygen, give uh, parastomal rectal suppository, IM midazolam, because non convulsive status epilepticus also has to be also ill. It must be treated with anticonvulsants. Now we'll go to the third case scenario. A one year old infant is brought to the OPD with the complaints of uh, fall from cot while sleeping 10 minutes back. The history is infant was crying after the fall, but was consolable. The cot is two feet high. There is no loss of consciousness, no vomiting or seizures. Parent says the child cries when the back of the head is touched. So what is the history now we have? A one-year-old baby with the history of fall from the cot. And following that, the child is otherwise normal, except for when you touch the back of the head, the child is crying. Now, on examining, the child is alert, breathing and circulation are normal. And when you examine the head, we can see a small palpable hematoma in the occipital region, a small one. But there is no uh, ecchymosis over the face or retroauricular region. The other systems are normal. So in this particular child, this is very common. We get this history fall from a cot or a ball while playing the ball, hitting the child or a door. Like this way, the, the children being brought with these complaints are quite common. So in this particular scenario, the diagnosis is minor blunt head trauma. Now there are two terminologies. Whenever you get a child who is, whenever you get a child with a history of uh, head trauma, one is minor trauma, the other one is major trauma. So what is minor trauma? It doesn't require surgical intervention. Major trauma, the other name, the term we use is clinically important traumatic brain injury. So what are the conditions? Epidural, epidural, subdural hematomas, cerebral contusion. So these are all the major head traumas or clinically important traumatic brain injury. So in any major trauma will require surgical intervention. So how do we uh, 
categorize any child coming with head trauma as minor or major. It depends on you have eliciting history and the one is by history, second is by clinical examination. So in the history, two points are important. One is mechanism of injury. The second is history of increased intracranial pressure. So in the history mechanism of injury, there are four points or four mechanisms. One is height. So to call as a major head trauma, when the child is falling from a height more than three feet, it is a, it's a major one. Second is high impact. Suppose a child is playing with other children and they are playing with a ball and a ball, which is a high impact object, the child's head is struck, struck with a high impact object like a ball. So that again is a major uh, mechanism. Third is motor vehicle collation. The child is traveling in a car, that is a collation. The child is being ejected out or that is a rollover of the motor vehicle. This is a major mechanism. Fourth is motorized vehicle hit. That means a child who is walking in a pavement or child is going in a bicycle without a helmet. If this child is being hit by a motorized vehicle, this again is a major mechanism. So in the mechanism of injury, these are the four pointers. Now, what is the history for increased intracranial pressure? Persistent headache, you all know this. Persistent headache, uh, persistent vomiting, drowsiness, convulsions, unsteadiness of gait. So these are all the pointers for increased intracranial pressure. So in the history, we should elicit the mechanism of injury and second is history of increased intracranial pressure. The third is, the next is clinical examination. So in, with the clinical examination, how are we going to point, what are the points which point towards the major head trauma? One is signs of basilar skull fracture. Second is the scalp hematoma. So what are the signs of basilar skull fracture? The, re, the periorbital ecchymosis, retroauricular ecchymosis, CSF rhinorrhea. So if these are there, it's an indication of basilar skull fracture. And uh, scalp hematoma, we uh, there is one score called as infant scalp score. So we in our medicine, we have a lot of scores, Abgar scores, uh, pulmonary index score. like. So any score now with, with some parameters, we are going to give some marks. So that tabular column, I'll be showing later. But uh, what are the parameters? What are the parameters Two, for? Three, infant? four, five. Six, seven. I'm getting a disturbance. Papa, water bottle. Kindly, others, please unmute. Kindly, please, others, unmute, please. Kindly, kindly mute, please. Others, please mute. Thank you. Yes, doctor. Proceed, proceed. Yeah, yeah. So in the scalp hematoma, what are the parameters? One is age in months. Second is size of hematoma. Third is site of site, the place of hematoma. So as the name indicates, it is infant scalp score. Abdina, this less than one year, one year and below. So when the a, first parameter age in month. So when the younger the child, it is a major point. It, the point is towards major injury. The size of the hematoma more than three centimeters, it's a point of a major injury. The site of hematoma, if it is non-frontal, the meaning of non frontal is if it is parietal, temporal, occipital, frontal, other places. So the site of hematoma. So these are the three points. If one year and below, when the younger, the age in months, the size of hematoma more than three centimeters and the site, which is not a frontal, non frontal area. So by with these two algorithms, the signs of basal skull fracture and the, uh, about the details of the scalp hematoma, again, we can decide whether it's a minor trauma or a major trauma. So this uh, tabular column is the infant scalp score, which I've already told. Now coming to our child. So the, uh, this one-year-old child was brought by the mother to fall from a cot less than two feet. So mechanism of injury, it is not a major one. There, are, there is no history of increased intracranial pressure. Then coming to the clinical examination, there is no sign of basal skull fracture like ecchymosis. And infant scalp hematoma score is less than four. So this child has got a minor head trauma. So no need to do a CT brain, MRI brain, no need to admit this child. Just uh, tell the parents, tell the mother the warning signs. If the warning signs of increased intracranial pressure, whether it's a headache or a vomiting or a giddiness, drowsiness, seizures, in the mari, these if these problems arise, these warning signs, if they come, you have to bring back the child. 
now we'll go to the so we have finished the neurological section now we'll go to the respiratory section here we have a six month old girl infant is brought to the outpatient clinic complaints is uh, fever cold cough three days and noisy breathing one day and uh, what is the nature of the cough it is a barking cough cough in addition hoarseness of voices present so with this we can come to with this history a reasonable conclusion we can come old cough bar, it's a barking cough three days and noisy breathing for one day you're examining the child uh, this uh, conscious consciousness breathing circulation the child is calm the barking cough is frequent the child has got a moderate respiratory distress the child has got a strider at rest and the spo2 is normal circulation is normal other systems are normal so what's the diagnosis it is an acute group that is acute laryngotracheal bronchitis how severe it is it is moderate severity and we all know croup means it is inflammation of the glottis larynx and the subglottic airway it's caused by viruses a para influenza virus so that is croup and why you call it as an acute croup suppose this child has got a this child is 6 month old uh, suppose uh, uh, from birth onwards there is a strider now we should think of laryngomalacia and moderate severity so severity of croup you put it as mild moderate and severe according to a westley score so we'll see what the westley score is this westley score is based on four parameters one is cough the frequency of the barking cough how much the retractions are is the second one third is about the strider fourth is about the sensorium whether the baby is calm or agitated so these are the four points based on which you are going to classify as mild moderate and severe so in mild group the barking cough will be occasional the retractions will be mild there is uh, strider only on exertion the baby will be calm and spo2 will be normal moderate group the barking cough is frequent the strider is there, there at rest moderate retractions the child is calm so what's the difference between mild group and moderate group the bark the barking cough will be more frequent and strider will be there at rest even so that's the difference between mild and moderate group what happens in severe group again the same thing frequent barking cough here also strider at rest so what's the difference between moderate and severe group this child more severe group child will have a hypoxemia spo2 will be less than 95 and the child will be very agitated so agitated child with hypoxemia with strider think of a severe group now how do i manage this child so child with this our particular child has got a moderate group because the cough there was a frequent barking cough there was a strider at rest the spo2 was normal and the moderate retractions were moderate so we classify under moderate severity so the mild and moderate group can be managed in the outpatient clinic only the severe group with hypoxemia we have to refer to a tertiary care center now this child with the moderate group we keep under the position of comfort try to keep the baby in the position of comfort And then we give oral dexamethasone the oral dexamethasone tablets are available 4 mg strength so you powder that oral uh, dexamethasone tablet and the dose is 0.6 mg per kg so that powder tablet you with water you give it to the baby or the uh, that's the first choice the second option will be your uh, dexamethasone the same dose 0.6 mg per kg can be given intramuscular and uh, with the, the oral dexamethasone the improvement will be evident within 6 hours the next is uh, so first you give dexamethasone next what you do you give an epinephrine one in 1000 solution with the strength of 1 mg per ml you put in you give as a nebulized form so the dose is 0.5 ml per kg per dose maximum 5 ml so when you give a nebulized epinephrine the effect will be there within 10 minutes okay and uh, when you give uh, epinephrine the uh, effect or the relief will be taking 10 to 15 minutes but after 2 hours you may get a rebound effect but this will be taken care by the dexamethasone so in a child with croup you have to give both that is oral dexamethasone plus nebulized epinephrine and even after 3 hours if the retractions are still the same you can give a second dose of nebulized epinephrine 
and we can give humidified oxygen in a non threatening manner so as i told you already mild and moderate group no need to refer you can manage in your outpatient clinic with oral or im intramuscular dexamethasone and nebulized epinephrine only when there is a severe group with hypoxemia which this and agitation hypoxemia and agitation you have to refer the child the next scenario is the respiratory a 5 year old boy is brought to the outpatient clinic with a cold cough 3 days and difficulty in breathing is one day he is a known asthmatic who has who had recurrent nebulization in the past so what do we have now in front of us we have a child who is a known case of bronchial asthma he has now come with acute exacerbation so on examining this particular 5 year old child when you see the consciousness he is uh, he is sitting in front of you in the chair uh, he is alert and when you ask some questions he is able to talk in sentences so this point is very very important he is able to talk converse with you breathing there is of course a respiratory distress you check the finger uh, spo2 with the finger pulse oximeter it is normal 95% of course circulation is normal so here he is able to talk in sentences the respiratory distress is moderate but there is no hypoxemia the spo2 is normal so what is our diagnosis bronchial asthma and what type of exacerbation he has he has a moderate exacerbation so again this uh, exacerbations of bronchial asthma we have three types mild moderate and severe which uh, this uh, sort of uh, classification is based on a pulmonary index score so two ways you can classify one is pulmonary index score the second classification is according to the british thoracic uh, society guidelines of 2019 where we have acute mild asthma moderate asthma acute severe asthma and life threatening asthma so this uh, i have simplified it so mild moderate severe and life threatening asthma so how will a child uh, so this mild and moderate asthma you can manage in your outpatient clinic this severe asthma and life threatening you need to refer to the tertiary care center now what is what are the points for a mild asthma the child will come to you he, he will be quite playful he will be having mild retractions the spo2 will be normal no tachycardia so this is a mild asthma moderate asthma again he will be uh, alert he will be able to answer you answer your question so talk in sentences moderate respiratory distress there is no hypoxemia so this is moderate asthma so this particular child whom we this 5 year old child is coming under moderate asthma now how to recognize uh, severe bronchial asthma the child is uh, coming is brought by the mother the child is too breathless he is not even able to talk or he is not able to feed or drink and severe retractions when you see the spo2 it is less than 92 so he definitely he has a hypoxemia so when the child is too breathless to talk not able to drink not able to feed when there is a hypoxemia spo2 less than 92 he comes under severe category then how to recognize life threatening asthma any child with asthma with altered sensorium unless proved otherwise it is a life threatening asthma now how so this tabular column is the pulmonary index score now how do we manage now uh, this 5 year old child i told you it's coming under moderate asthma so here i am going to use uh, i am not going to nebulize so mild and moderate asthma no need of nebulization you can manage with mdi with spacer so the first i am going to give salbutamol mdi with spacer four puffs has to be given and uh, and each after each puff the child has to take a tidal breathing of five breaths okay and so four puffs i give and then i wait for 20 minutes i give again so and just see how the child is responding and also you give oral prednisolone 2 mg per kg maximum 60 mg so these are these two are the initial measures so the child is in front of you you give an oral prednisolone 2 mg per kg you uh, start the child on salbutamol meter dose inhaler with spacer give four puffs each each puff you give five tidal breathing after this you and the, the response for your treatment is usually observed within 2 hours so if the child is responding to you usually they will respond so the ch responsive child you continue the meter dose inhaler first you are giving every 20 minutes for 1 hour then you give 
two puffs every two hours, then every four hours. Like this, you continue the MDI with spacer for 48 hours. So this is the management of moderate asthma. Now, what about severe? Suppose this child, I told you, when the child is uh, too uh, sick, to, too, uh, too much of distress to talk, or when there is hypoxemia, if you receive such a child in your outpatient clinic with hypoxemia, what are you going to do? We have to give oxygen. Now you can start using the nebulization. So nebulization can be used in a severe asthma with hypoxemia. You give oxygen, you give nebulized salbutamol and iprotropium, and this uh, nebulization should be with oxygen, not the power driven, you have to give with oxygen. And the dose of salbutamol nebulization is fixed less than 20 kg, you give 2.5, more than 20 kg, you give 5 milligram. And uh, the, about the dose of hypertropium bromide, less than 20 kg, you give 250 microgram and more than 20 kg, you give 500 microgram. Now, one point I would like to tell here, this uh, fixed dose combination is not recommended. The fixed dose combination of salbutamol and dipratropium is not ideal. You can take separately, you can take a uh, salbutamol nebulizing solution, put in the chamber, take uh, dipratropium nebulizing solution. You can mix them separately, you can mix them, but don't use the fixed dose. On this slide, I'm telling what are the strengths available, the strength of the salbutamol nebulizer solution, uh, salbutamol respule, levolin respule, ipravent respule. The, uh, okay, now you have given oxygen, you have started nebulization. What is the next you are going to do? You have to give systemic steroids. So systemic steroids, you can give injection hydrocortisone, preferable is intravenous. Intra, uh, injection hydrocortisone, four milligram per kg can be given four hourly. Or if you're not able to secure the vein, you can give injection dexamethasone, 0. 0.6 milligram per kg IM. So these three measures, oxygen, nebulization, and uh, intramuscular dexa. This in your clinic, you can do all these three things, and then you can refer the child. And uh, there is one entity called silent child. A child with severe asthma, when you auscultate, there is no airflow at all. This, this is uh, because of the severe bronchospasm. In such a situation, you have to give an intramuscular epinephrine 0 0.01 milligram per kg of one in thousand solution. So acute severe asthma with hypoxemia, with all these initial measures, you can refer. Mild and moderate, you can manage in your outpatient clinic. Now the next scenario, uh, a two-year-old child is brought to the over. The mother says, my child was eating groundnuts in a plate and uh, this child was playing with another. The child, the child has a mild difficulty in breathing. So what is the history? Two-year-old child playing with another child with a plate of groundnuts. When mother noticed that, the child developed a sudden cough. And following the cough, the child is having mild difficulty in breathing. With such a history, when you examine, the child is alert. The child has mild uh, subcostal retractions. When you auscultate, the, there is decreased air entry in the right side. A wheeze is present in the right side. The right side is normal and the SpO2 is 96%. And the circulation is normal. So what is the diagnosis? It's very obvious. Foreign body aspiration in a toddler. And this child is stable, but the child is symptomatic. And why, why foreign body aspiration? You all know there was a history of choking, choking. So sudden onset of cough or dyspnea in a previously healthy child occurs immediately after aspiration. So with this history of choking and clinical findings, we think of a foreign body aspiration. So if the management of this child, symptomatic child, if facility exists, take an X-ray chest. In the X-ray chest, look for hyperinflation or atelectasis. And uh, even if the X-ray chest is normal with the above symptomatology and clinical findings, the diagnosis is foreign body aspiration. And this child requires a bronchoscopy. Now this uh, slide, in a foreign scenario of foreign body aspiration, what are the, what are the events that can happen? Four things can happen. One is the child aspirates the foreign body, coughs out and expectorates. That is the first thing that can happen. Second is 
the child aspirates, coughs, and then swallows it. So that is the second thing that can happen. The third is uh, the child may die from a complete airway obstruction. We have had seen children like that. And the fourth thing, what can happen is the, like our child, what this child is brought, two year old child is brought with symptoms. So, with a uh, symptom, symptomatically, the child may be brought. Fifth is without any symptoms, also, this child can uh, present. So, these are the five ways the foreign body aspiration can present to us. And uh, why we should recognize the foreign body aspiration? Because you all know that if you don't treat, the child will have a rec will develop recurrent pneumonias and also a bronchitis. So we have to recognize and we have to treat foreign body aspiration. Uh, and uh, rarely, the as I told you in this uh, picture, rarely we may get a child without any symptoms at all. The, the, the child must have got choked, must have had a foreign body aspiration. But when they bring to you, the, there may not be any symptoms at all. The, when you examine the respiratory system, examination is completely normal. So in, that is very rare, but still that scenario can occur. So that time what you should do, you should tell, you can send the child back home, but you have to tell the parents about the warning signs, like new onset of cough, wheeze, difficulty in breathing. So in the Mari problem, you have to tell the parents. Now we'll go to the next scenario. A two-year-old girl child is brought by the mother with the complaints of hot water spillage on the body 10 minutes back. So any, uh, this is, uh, we do get few children now and then. Tea mala uti tanga, soda na coffee uti tanga, soda na kolambu uti tanga. So in the Madhuri and children, we do get in our outpatient clinic. Uh, on examination, this two-year-old child is crying the breathing and circulation are normal. And when you examine the child, we can see skulls in front of the chest and the upper abdomen. The skin is peeled in certain areas. The skin is appearing red. Few blisters are there and other systems are normal. So what is the diagnosis in this child? You all know it's the minor burns and it is a partial thickness burns and it is involving 10% of the body surface area. So I have told three terms, minor burns, second is partial thickness, third term is 10% body surface area. So each one has got uh, certain significance. So why you call it as minor burns? It is based on two parameters. The burns are classified as, just like you, we had a heteroma child classified as minor and major, a burns child also we classify as minor and major. So how do we classify? There are two parameters. One is the depth of the burn. Second is the extent of the burns. So this slide, we can see depth of the burns, the classification based on extent, classification based on depth. So based on depth, what are the what is the classification? We have epidermal burns. Second is dermal burns. Third is subcutaneous burns. So in the dermal, we have partial thickness and full thickness. All these I will show you in the next slide how to differentiate. And based on extent, extent in our area of the burn, we can use the lone browder chart. I'll be showing you the chart in the next slide. Now we'll see the depth of the burns. So this uh, picture is a very important picture. I like this uh, slide very much. So we can see in the left side is the area, the layers of the skin, the epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous fat and muscle. And on the right side is the classification of depth. So a first one is epidermal. Epidermal means just the epidermal alone, the epidermis alone is involved. The second is dermal. Dermal, abrina, both epidermis, and the dermis is involved. The full dermis involved in it is full thickness. Part of the dermis involved in it is called partial thickness. Full thickness, partial thickness. So in full thickness, both epidermis and full dermis will be involved. Partial thickness, na epidermis and part of the epidermis. The third is deep burns. Deep burns in epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous, LMA. All the three are affected. It is a deep burns. Now, how to recognize clinically this, uh, uh, this uh, what is it, the depth. So in epidermal burns, blisters, there will be no blisters. It will be very painful. 
and when you see the burns it will be red in color so red in skin peel are so red in color there is no blister and it will be painful what happens in a dermal burns in a partial thickness burns there will uh, there will be red color the skin will be peeled there is red in color occasionally cheesy white area there you pain kandipa irukum pain will be there and blisters will be there what we see commonly in our outpatient clinic is the partial thickness burns so there will be red areas occasionally cheesy white areas pain will be there blisters will be there what about the uh, full thickness full thickness and deep burns la pain irukada there will be no pain there will be no blisters and in a full thickness la vande it will be red ah irukad it will be fully waxy white white color la irukum so that is the full thickness deep burns la charred ah irukum up to muscle kuda theriyum but now what we see commonly is the partial thickness burns where the skin is peeled red in color occasional cheesy white pain irukum and blisters blisters are characteristic of the partial thickness burns so in this we can see the partial thickness burns first picture la blisters irukku skin is peeled there is a red in color now we have finished now the depth of the burns we have finished next is the area of the burns so we can use two uh, two methods we can find out the area one is the lone browder chart inda vande nama net la download panni we can we can download it laminate it and keep it in the outpatient clinic the other practical method is the palmer surface of child's hand palmer surface of the, that particular patient's or child's hand is 1% so that is the second method one method lund browder chart you can have a laminated chart in your outpatient table clinic table or second practical one the child or the palm is the 1% so so that is how we the area of the burns we decide now we have seen the depth of the burns and the area of the burns now when to refer when the child in the person area is more than 10% body surface area when it is a full thickness or deep burns and burns involving the face hands and feet genitalia and perineum and across the major joints so in the moon conditions we have to refer the child so why face we have to refer now cosmetic reasons why perineum now the skin is very thin why uh, the hand and foot burns and across the joints you know the, the, the functional area if we don't treat properly there may be disability now what do we do what's the treatment how did this particular child is come to your outpatient clinic sitting in front of you with only 10% body surface area and it's only a partial thickness burns so what are we going to do for this particular child so we have to wash cleans with the mild soap and water use the normal tap water don't use ice and this partial thickness burns we have to it requires dressing so you do some mild debridement you remove the necrotic debris and one important point is don't puncture the intact blisters leave them alone and after cleaning the wounds you can apply a topical antibiotic above that a paraffin gauze then above that a dry fluff gauze and then you can use an outer gauze roll that is one option the second option is we can use a collagen sheet which is available in packs uh, different sizes 10 by 10 cm 10 by 15 and the mari different sizes like it's available it's kind of expensive for a fresh uninfected burns we can use the collagen sheet then you give for pain you give paracetamol or ibuprofen for itching you give diphenhydramine syrup and uh, you need not give antibiotics but if but always watch for cellulitis if it is if they are, watch for cellulitis look at the borders look at the hyperemia uh, look for any confluent uh, redness cellulitis develop agra mari irunda we can give antibiotics tetanus toxoid if fully immunized don't give another dose otherwise you if the child is not vaccinated at all now you give dpt three doses and how long it will take for the partial thickness burns to heal it will take two to three weeks this is the collagen sheet this is the sheet applied on the burns area now we'll go to the next case the a 4 year old boy is brought with the mother says the payana kolavi kottirchu so wasp sting 15 minutes back and he is now sitting in front uh, front of you in the clinic and mother says romba sorinjite irukka romba itching irukku and konjam moochoda irukku kashta padra so the child has a breathing difficulty and no vomiting abdominal pain nor no dizziness so we have a 4 year child kolavi kadi uh, itching irukku breathing difficulty irukku but there is no vomiting abdominal pain with this history 
we all know uh, with this history the uh, then you examine the child when you see the child the child has got the generalized articaria articarial rashes the lips are swollen but the child is alert when you see the breathing there are mild retractions when you ask to the child there is a wheeze bilateral wheeze uh, spo2 with a finger pulse oximeter the spo2 is normal it is 95 percent the sir important circulation perfusion is normal warm peripheries the pulses are normal and the heart rate is normal and other systems are normal so what's our diagnosis acute anaphylaxis with normal perfusion so acute anaphylaxis normal perfusion so we should what is why do we call it as acute anaphylaxis so to say a child with acute anaphylaxis there are four criteria one is involvement of skin and mucosal tissue second is respiratory involvement fourth is gi symptoms so in this slide we can see for an anaphylaxis four criteria first one is skin and mucosal skin and mucosal means it is articarial rashes in the skin mucosal na lip edema tongue edema idella irundhuchuna it is angio edema so that is the skin and this is a common 90 percent of children with acute anaphylaxis one they will have the skin and mucosal involvement the second commonest presentation one the respiratory so what respiratory presentation the child will have a wheeze and the third presentation is cardiovascular 45 percent have cardiovascular what is the cardiovascular manifestation shock shock or you can or even collapse and uh, hypotension and collapse that's the third manifestation fourth one the in 45 percent gastrointestinal what gastrointestinal vomiting abdominal pain these are the two gastrointestinal manifestations so we have four types of uh, four uh, types of manifestations of which the commonest is skin and mucosal second common respiratory then the uh, equal percentage cardiovascular and gastrointestinal so in these four criteria at least if two are present you diagnose the acute anaphylaxis and I told the diagnosis acute anaphylaxis with normal perfusion. So that perfusion is very important. So perfusion normal, you need not rush in IV fluids. You need not give IV fluids. Only when there is a shock, you have to give. Uh, we have to rush. It's a distributive shock and we have to rush in IV fluids. Otherwise, no need to rush in. So this particular child who is sitting in front of you with the colavicadi, uh, acute anaphylaxis and normal perfusion what we're going to give the first uh, uh, step is going to be you give an intramuscular epinephrine so what uh, one in thousand solution and in epinephrine uh, ampule it will be one milligram per ml what is the dose Point zero one milligram per kg you give intramuscular in the outer thigh and about the giving epinephrine i would like to show you it's better always uh, all the outpatient clinics try to have an insulin syringe which is uh, 100 units 1 ml so you should have an insulin syringe in which the 1 ml is equal to 100 units so it is easy to calculate the epinephrine dose so the dose is 0.01 ml per kg of 1 in 1000 so in a 10 kg child you give 10 units 15 kg now 15 units 20 kg now 20 units so when you use a 100 units insulin syringe you can easily calculate it and give it intramuscular so this is about the first drug you're giving that is intramuscular epinephrine from then you can give injection hydrocortisone two milligram per kg injection avil injection ranitin oxygen by face mask we'll go to the ninth uh, case scenario a two-month-old girl is come coming to your outpatient clinic the mother says to you the my child is crying uh, going on crying for past two hours uh, from morning onwards, the child is feeling warm. So uh, for fever, I have given one dose of paracetamol. So this baby is brought to you in front of you. The child is crying. The birth and neonatal history is normal. The child is on exclusive breastfeeds. So two-month-old child with law excessive crying, you have it in front of you. So when you examine the child, the baby is uh, active. I mean, the baby is alert not active alert the child is febrile when you check the temperature it is 101 degree fahrenheit breathing and circulation is normal and when you examine there is pain on severe the the crying is very much on movement of the right lower limb so with this history and with this examination finding we should provisional diagnosis of septic arthritis so this child requires an ultrasound hip and an mri hip 
for urgent evacuation joint flu fluid culture and intravenous antibiotics now this child why i brought this case scenario is that whenever a, this a child or a baby brought with prolonged crying is a common uh, complaint i mean we do get now and then uh, such babies i call in the rendu mannaram aludittirukku moonu mannaram aludittirukku that some mothers bring the babies to you so in such a uh, scenario what what all you should what all you should assess to find out the causes what i have shown shown is septic arthritis but what are the other causes when a baby is brought with prolonged crying so the two month old baby or a, in an infant always look for the hydration and the growth chart to identify the underfeeding second you pal palpate the anterior fontanel to see whether it is bulging or not third you look at the eyes look for any foreign body look for corneal clouding to look for a congenital glaucoma next you look the ears the drum or titus media then you open the mouth and look for any uh, look into the oral cavity for thrush then skin and musculoskeletal system la look for any bruise the non accidental trauma so trauma or bruising irukana we should see then look for any decreased movement or pain on passive movement so on the mari decrease uh, decreased movement or when you move the limb uh, the child is crying more abina think of osteomyelitis and septic arthritis and in the cardiovascular system even a child with supraventricular tachycardia can present with excessive crying especially in infancy how does it uh, what is the characteristic it is characterized by episodes of irritability crying tachycardia so the child will be irritable and it will be crying so how long the child will be crying 10 to 15 minutes apra all thana settle idom self limiting so when the child is crying like this if there is a frequent history you can take an ecg oru naal aludha we don't do it but frequent ah adikadi the my child is uh, irritable going on crying for 10 to 15 minutes for one week abina you take an ecg ecg we find the narrow qrs normal rr interval heart rate is more than 220 per minute so in the mari episodes of prolonged crying for a long time irundhuchuna அது செல்ஃப் லிமிட்டிங் டிப்பிக்கலாக ஃபிஃப்டீன் மினிட்ஸ் ஆளுகும் அப்புறம் நல்லா இருக்கும் இந்த மாதிரி இருந்துச்சுன்னா திங்க் ஆஃப் எஸ்விடி அண்ட் இஃப் வி டோன்ட் ரெக்கக்னைஸ் எஸ்விடி ஃபார் அ லாங் டைம் இட் லீட்ஸ் டு ஹார்ட் ஃபெயிலியர் தென் அப்டமன் சப்போஸ் இந்த ஹிஸ்ட்ரி தெர் இஸ் அ பிளடி ஸ்டூல் அண்ட் தெர் இஸ் அ வாமிட்டிங் தெர் இஸ் அ பிளடி ஸ்டூல் வென் யூ டச் த அப்டமன் இட் இஸ் டெண்டர் ஆல்வேஸ் இன் அ பிளடி ஸ்டூல் இன் அன் இன்ஃபென்ட் திங்க் ஆஃப் இன்டு சப்ஷன் அண்ட் வால்வலஸ் last is the perineum in the perineum look for a diaper rash look for a meatal ulcer and look for a testicular torsion so we have seen nine uh, pointers any prolonged crying child we have to check all these areas to look for, uh, try to find to try to get clues to find out the cause if all these above causes are excluded now we come to a presumptive diagnosis of infantile colic we remember uh, the what child that has come to us is a two month old child so if all cause if we exclude in uh, we make a presumptive diagnosis of infantile colic in another ways healthy infant so idukku vand what are the criteria the child will be less than 3 to 4 months of age and the crying will be more than 3 hours per day and in one week Three days, more than three days, the three days and above, this sort of uh, crying episodes will be there. And there is no apparent reason like hunger or soil. In this scenario, we think of an uh, infantile colic. And why do, how do you treat an infantile colic? First is tell the mother, your baby is not sick. The baby is not sick. And this condition will resolve by three to four months of age. And after every feeding, do burping. So do frequent burping. third is we do soothing soothing the baby so we can provide a warm bath gently rub the abdomen so these uh, this way these can be followed and if the mother is atopic to avoid the diet with milk eggs nuts and wheat what about the available madam there is fresh sir audio disturbance others mute please others mute please okay then uh, the commonly used cybethicone herbal remedies like gripe water probiotics they are not of proven use now we'll come to the last case scenario uh, 
டென் இயர் ஓல்ட் சைல்டு இஸ் ப்ராட் டு த அவுட் பேஷண்ட் கிளினிக் த கம்ப்ளைண்ட்ஸ் வந்து ஹை கிரேட் ஃபீவர் டிசியூரியா டூ டேஸ் த மதர்ஸ் இஸ் ஃபீவர் அண்ட் டிசியூரியா டூ டேஸாக இருக்கு அண்ட் த சைல்டு இஸ் இரிட்டபிள் ஃப்ரம் டுடே டுடே த சைல்டு இஸ் வெரி இரிட்டபிள் அண்ட் த சைல்ட் பீன் ட்ரீட்டட் பை அனதர் டாக்டர் வித் சம் மெடிக்கேஷன்ஸ் ஆனால் ஸ்டில் த ப்ராப்ளம் பர்சஸ்ட் ஸோ இந்த ஃபீவர் டிசியூரியா இரிட்டபிலிட்டி எல்லாம் அப்படி இருந்துகிட்டே இருக்கு அண்ட் வித் இஸ் ஷார்ட் ஹிஸ்ட்ரி யூ ஆர் எக்ஸாமினிங் த சைல்ட் த சைல்டு இஸ் ஆப்வியஸ்லி டென் இயர் ஓல்ட் சைல்ட் இஸ் ஆப்வியஸ்லி இரிட்டபிள் அண்ட் வென் யூ சீ த ப்ரீத்திங் த சைல்ட் ஹாஸ் காட் அ மைல் ரெஸ்பிரேட்டரி டிஸ்ட்ரெஸ் த சைல்ட் இஸ் ஃபெப்ரைல் and when you uh, touch the circulation to check for the circulation the peripheries are warm the pulses are bounding there is a fra- flash capillary refill there is tachycardia so this uh, this is the examination findings irritable child with respiratory distress uh, not uh, with uh, tachypnea and uh, warm peripheries bounding pulses and flash uh, flash capillary refill and with this we come to a diagnosis of warm septic shock and uh, this uh, then why i am diagnosing a warm septic shock shock means decreased perfusion the cold shock it is e- we can easily diagnose cold shock na kai kal chill en irukum child vande konja drowsy a irukum so cold shock vande we can identify little bit uh, better easy warm shock is uh, quite difficult to identify avena periphery is warm a irukum ana pulse vande fever irukum pulse bounding irukum flash refill irukum and there will be undue tachycardia and tachypnea so th- that is so it is difficult to identify a warm septic shock and uh, we have to use sirs criteria there are sirs criteria clinically you have to look for heart rate respiratory rate and blood pressure and one lab criteria leukocytosis so sirs la vand naal irukku naal criteria heart rate respiratory rate blood pressure oru idu da lab criteria that is leukocytosis so in the naal criteria la even if two are there you take it as systemic inflammatory response syndrome you should think of a sepsis and look for a infection look uh, you have to look for the sources of infection where all you have to look for sources of infection in this child it can be skin and soft tissue infection it can be soft tissue infection cell uh, some abscess and then you look for osteomyelitis septic arthritis these all comes under skin uh, soft tissue and skeletal infections look for pneumonia intra abdominal conditions like pyelonephritis abscess Uh, so these are all the few conditions you should look for the source of sepsis and when you suspect a septic and one more thing i forgot to tell this tachycardia and tachypnea should be corrected for age and temperature so eppadi vand how to find, how to correct for age na this uh, this slide shows the chart the heart respiratory rate and heart rate for different ages so this you can take a, you can download it and put a laminated sheet and keep it on your table this is the uh, range of respiratory rate and heart rate in different ages now the then i told you the heart rate and respiratory rate uh, adjusted to corrected to temperature so what how you can correct to temperature for every 1.8 degree fahrenheit more than the normal temperature you have to reduce the heart rate by 10 beats per minute and for that is the corrected heart rate what is corrected respiratory rate for every 1.8 degree fahrenheit above normal temperature you have to de- mm-hmm. 